right. As Doug and Phil mentioned, thank you guys for coming down, especially those that you have traveled quite a long way. Um, definitely appreciate you all being here. My name is Wes Lambert, and I want to talk to you guys today about Security Onion and how you might leverage certain components in Security Onion to facilitate automation and orchestration of maybe common tasks that you perform as an analyst or as an engineer. So going into that, I want to talk a little bit about Security Onion. What is Security Onion? I'm just kidding. No, we're not going to talk about Security Onion. Right, so all of you are here today because you may have used Security Onion in some form or use it daily, right? So we're not going to talk about Security Onion so much or get into an explanation of that, but I do want to talk a little bit about SOAR itself. Now, SOAR typically, uh, we refer to it as Security Orchestration Automation and Response. And a lot of times this is a really big buzzword. A lot of people like to throw it around, a lot of vendors do, and uh, talk about how they can help you do these cool things. Um, but it can be useful if used correctly or if used uh, advantageously and judiciously. So uh, when we talk about SOAR, we really want to focus on easing that burden of analysis for analysts, at least in our case and referring to Security Onion. Really want to focus on reducing those repetitive tasks, those things that we do every day, maybe uh, if they are lookups to a particular service or uh, you know, something of that nature. And we really want to provide that additional context very quickly, uh, immediately if we can, but obviously that's, that's somewhat difficult to do in some cases. Uh, overall, we want to seek to decrease that total time to resolution, right, when we're going from an investigation, when we're looking at something in stock and uh, hunt or alerts, and then actually going, you know, coming to a determination from that event or that alert and, that, um, and really reduce that time there. And there's a lot of other opportunities as well. Instead of just you know, automating these analyst types of tasks, things like threat intel, uh, things like um, you know, your detection pipeline. So there are a lot of other opportunities that you can approach here that we won't necessarily discuss. But uh, just keep that in mind. Now, there are some free commercial SOAR platforms. Uh, one of them is Simplify, uh, you know, Cortex XSOAR. Uh, these are all have a community edition that you can sign up for and uh, get going with pretty quickly. And, you, you know, you don't necessarily have to pay a ton of money to get started uh, experimenting with one of these. So there are definitely a lot of options there. Additionally, there are some free and open SOAR and automation platforms, uh, one of them being Shuffle. Uh, Shuffle markets itself as, a, as, as an open source SOAR platform. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff in Shuffle if you want to mess with that. Uh, N8N is another one. It's one that I probably use the most, uh, use the heaviest, and it's not necessarily a SOAR platform, but more of a just an automation or workflow automation platform. And then Node-RED is also another one uh, that you can get into. The interface is not as pretty as N8N, but it is pretty uh, functionally, uh, pretty, pretty good functionally at least. Now, how do I soar good, right? This is, you know, how do I implement this in a way that's beneficial and I get the most bang for my buck? Well, I'm just going to tell you this is not going to be the Derek Soarlander school for IT pros who can't soar good. So this will not be a complete lecture on soar, but really some basic kind of tenets and some basic ways that uh, we can kind of ensure that we are focusing on the right things. There's not really a universal answer. It really depends on your overall use case and requirements. Uh, you really want to focus on those most repetitive tasks and the things that are of the highest value, the things that you see your analysts doing day in and day out, again and again, and that, you know, they get tired of doing the same old thing over and over. These are the things that you want to seek to automate whenever you can, right? whenever it makes sense. Um, these are the things that keep people sane and, uh, you know, not quitting because they're looking at, a, you know, 100,000 alerts, uh, you know, along with tuning, um, looking at so many alerts and trying to do the same thing over and over. So when we talk about how we soar well, uh, we really want to focus on our core playbooks. And what I mean by this is, how we approach certain types of incidents or certain events uh, within our organization. 
for example, you know, what is our standard procedure for an account compromise or for phishing or whatnot? Uh, we want to have these planned out. We want to have the logic drawn out before we attempt to automate these things because what ends up happening uh, when a lot of people start trying to implement a SOAR platform or an orchestration platform is they look and see all these shiny features and they want to go set it up, but they're not really sure what they want to do or they're not really sure how to do it. Um, and they may not even have a standard process in place, right? I mean, they may not even know how to do this manually. And it doesn't necessarily make a ton of sense to try to automate something that you don't, can't do manually. So uh, the end result there ends up being that you get a lot of stakeholders and a lot of people who have bought into the products maybe um, you know, from up top and have spent money on the team and on the platform and they're not really seeing any value or much value and it's hard to continue advocating for that platform's use, right? I mean, if, if this thing's not doing what we expected it to do, then why should we continue using it? Here is, and I know this is kind of hard to read, this is more for a later review, but um, just an example of a playbook, um, an account compromise playbook from the detection perspective. And you can see here, it's, again, it's kind of hard to see, but you'll, you'll see that there's, and, you know, there's alerts like ticket and tickets or SIM, um, and then there's you know, IOCs, and these are all you know, part of this chain of the detection. And we're mapping out how you know, we want to plan our detection. And then also you know, from the response phase and, and, and other phases, we can also have this mapped out, and then we can seek to apply that automation. Again, you really want to have this, at least this logical flow nailed down and the technical capabilities available before you start trying to automate it. Because if you're trying to go set up this workflow in the SOAR platform and you don't even know how to hook into the downstream service or do that task um, you know, manually, then it doesn't make a lot of sense. You're spending a lot of time doing unnecessary things. Now there are some example IR playbooks. Um, Syntax IR, is, that's where I got this one. Uh, there are simple kind of playbooks just drawn in uh, draw.io. So it's a fairly you know, straightforward presentation you can go through and look at. And then there are some other links here as well. And uh, you know, just, just kind of go through these if you don't already have playbooks in your organization. Kind of go through these and it, it'll help you get an idea of how to draw, your own, draw out your own playbooks. And then you can start to apply that automation. So we talked a little bit about SOAR and kind of ran through that very quickly, um, but how do we apply that to Security Onion or how do we leverage the facilities that Security Onion has to give us data or to take that data and get additional context or perform additional actions and act on that data? There are a few here that I'll go through. So actions is something that we implemented in Security Onion 2 and it's really awesome. Um, it's a, it's a way basically to act on an event in an ad hoc fashion. For example, if you're going through hunt or you're going through uh, the alerts pane and you're looking at something and you want to do something to that data or take that data and transform it in a certain way, get a different perspective on that data or go perform some action, right? It's called an action. So we can leverage those event details and that field data and we can go off and take that and do fun things with it. Right? We can perform an HTTP, HTTP post to a webhook. So if we have a SOAR platform set up, we can have a webhook listening and then post to that, post that relevant data, post those relevant details, and then go from there and enrich that or do other things. Here's an example of a SOC action configuration for N8N. So if you have N8N set up and you have a webhook listening, then you can use this. You'll see at the bottom there is a links section and that is actually, um, that's relative to the server because I have this in this instance set up on the same instance or the same server as Security Onion. So SOC knows to go you know, to itself basically or, or to the root and then to N8N and then hit that webhook test URL. And right here we're just posting some bogus values here but uh, you can kind of see how you can take that data um, and I, I see something equals blah one right there. You can actually put in the body, you know, the entire event, right? Or I'm sorry, not the entire event, but you know, certain fields from the event or build on that, right? You can format that however you wish. Then have the downstream, 
downstream application parse that. Another thing, another way to do this is with the Hive's own webhooks. Uh, this is gonna be a little bit different versus the actions. It's going to be a continuous processing or a continuous notification. So uh, an HTTP endpoint is gonna receive a notification from the Hive in this case if you have it configured and then it can act on it accordingly. So if you have a case or you've added observables to a case or you know, you've added other details if it's been updated, uh, you can send notifications for that to that endpoint and then have that automation platform act on that. And then you can make other decisions, you know, run workflow X based on that, um, you know, with X or YZ details. So there's a lot of granularity you can get with that. And here's an example of the Hive webhook configuration. You'll see here there's just a URL that's pointing to the manager. Uh, again, I have this on the same node as Security Onion. So I'm just pointing it to the uh, port 5678 locally. And then it's going off and it's sending that to NADN and then it's processing it however I wish. I can go off from there. I can go look at that data further, do some lookups to you know maybe uh, who is if I wish, spam house. Um, I can go send an email. I can go do whatever I wish. Another one would be Elastalert. So if you're heavily deviating from how we use Playbook and how we implement detections in there and the Elastalert rules that it generates, then you would want to develop some native Elastalert rules to handle that. And this is gonna be another continuous way to monitor and search against Elasticsearch for any events of interest. And it's a little bit uh, more granular in this form as far as the pre-filtering because you're gonna be able to set your criteria a little bit more specifically. Um, you're gonna be able to filter out things and really look for the things that you care about most and then go from there. And again, you can use the HTTP post alerter or a custom alerter to post that to the automation platform, like NADN. And here is an example rule for sending NIDS events to, I'm sorry, I've, this is actually a Yara, so I've got it mixed up here. Uh, a Yara match uh, to a SOAR platform. And so what it'll look for here is, let me actually see if I can correct this real quick. Yara matches. All right. So that'll take those Yara matches that come from Strelka, um, Zeke, and Suricata extract files from the network stream and if configured to do so, uh, whatever files uh, that are extracted can be sent to Strelka and Strelka will apply Yara rules to those. So what we're doing here is we're taking those Yara rule matches and we're sending those off. We're doing some further investigation. Maybe we want to search a host or a group of hosts to see if that file exists, uh, you know, based on the hash or some other value. So we can do that with Elastalert. And there is another way to do this. Uh, Logstash is one way to do it. Um, I would probably recommend against this if you, um, if you don't have to. Um, it, is a, it would be a continuous fashion and you can use the HTTP output plugin or uh, there are several other plugins that you can leverage to post that event to the you know, webhook or some other service. And you can filter, uh, the benefit here is, I guess, you can filter and enrich these events before sending them. So if there's any additional data that you want to get from Security Onion uh, or filter, then you can do that before sending it along. But there are some things to be aware of from the manager and search node perspective, being that if you're trying to forward events from the manager, uh, they are going to be typically the raw event that's going to come in from FileView. So you want to keep in mind that they will not be transformed in the same way or decorated in the same way as they would be if they're exiting a search node. But then the downside to a search node would be that you're sending it from multiple nodes, right? So uh, just something to keep in mind there. And I also want to talk about escalation. Um, there is currently not a way to do this for escalation, an official way. Um, and so please don't go try this in production, but if you do want to play around with this, you can, um, you can change the URL of the hive, basically. So instead of performing an escalation to the hive, 
we can actually escalate that again to an automation platform. So if instead of creating a case in the hive, maybe we don't want to use the hive, or maybe we can't use the hive in our environment, uh, this is one way to do this currently and be able to escalate those events up and have them disappear from the queue and actually be escalated to that platform. And we do have some plans to separate this out eventually and make this a little more modular, but uh, again, this is one way you can achieve this right now. Okay, so how might we, you know, sending it to the platform, um, you know, I talked about some ways that we can send it to a sort platform, uh, to an automation platform. Um, you know, what can we do once we get there? Uh, I have a couple of use cases, and these are fairly simple, but you can certainly expand on these as you experiment and as you uh, kind of get the juices flowing and think through this. But uh, one of these is contextual enrichment, which is going to be pretty, I think, pretty important, and I think something that, as analysts, we always seek to get that additional context, whether it be pivoting from an action typically either going over to virus total and looking something up for additional context, see if it's bad or not. Um, we can do the same thing. We can run Cortex analyzers automatically against event details. If we have a list of analyzers we want to run automatically against an event, we can do this from any of those mechanisms that I mentioned, right? So from the action, from the escalation, from the you know, log stash, whatever. We can send to that webhook and maybe look up uh, at spam house, see if it's been blacklisted. If it's not clean, then we can send an email, or if we do still want to create a case in the hive, then we can do so at that point. The list goes on and on as far as how you could customize this. And this is, um, this is NADN, and in case I didn't clarify earlier, this, this is, is an example of one of those NADN workflows. Now another use case, uh, the second use case that I'm going to mention here is actually searching hosts for evidence. And then acting on that, actually performing a remediation or other response actions, right? We can take, uh, you know, action. Uh, we can, for example, search for a file name or a hash on an endpoint or across all of our endpoints at once. We can quarantine if detected. We can remove scheduled tasks. And this example right here is using the Hive. So <clears throat> this is, is an example of the Hive webhooks. And then from here, we're checking the observable type, and we're saying, all right, if observable type is file name, then we're going to go do this. If observable type is hash, then we're going to go do this. And uh, you, can ha you can apply that granularity and branch off in many different directions if you need to. And then, if you want to experiment with this, you can try out SOAR Lab, which is the Security Onion Automation and Response Lab. This is something we put together uh, not long ago, just trying to demonstrate how you can leverage a SOAR platform or an automation platform in conjunction with an EDR, like Velociraptor, which is an open source EDR and visibility platform. Now, I'll say that this is not for production use, so um, you know, use it at your own risk, but it does give you an idea of how this could be implemented, and this could eventually morph into a more mature implementation later. But for now, it's demo time, right? So we're going to pray to the demo gods, and we're going to hope that everything works as planned. We've done our sacrifices, so let's go for it. Anybody have any questions so far? All right. Yep. Sure, I think that'd be a great question for then. So I'll save that for later, but thank you for that. All right, so make sure you can see my screen here. All right, so right now what I'm doing is I actually stood up SOAR Lab. I ran through the install script. And what this did was it set up on top of Security Onion a version of N8N, the automation platform. 
and then also Velociraptor. So I have a Velociraptor server on here as well. And what I've done is in the, you know, in the, in the SOAR lab, we have a video that goes along with the SOAR lab, and this was based off of an article where I demonstrate a uh, suspicious file that Strelka was able to detect with a YAR rule. So if we look real quick, let me just close this. I'll actually show you this. So this suspicious file it's actually right here. I can type. This was this poker.bat file. And what happened here was that you know, an adversary, we're simulating an adversary attempting to obfuscate the intention of this script. Um, and so we have basically Strelka watching the files that come down from the network from the Conserricata. And then it's going to run Yara against those files whenever those files are copied over into its unprocessed directory. And this file right here is just an example of something that was generated from one of the resources in the SORLAB repo. And, uh oh, come on. So if I do. Right, so just this obfuscated bat.py, and this just creates a payload bat file, and it, it essentially runs through, it's just running calc.exe on the back end, but for now we're gonna say it's malicious, right, it's bad. So uh, we generate this poker.bat file from the script, and then we've simulated the, uh, you know, the processing of Zconsuricata, pulling that down, and we've copied that into the unprocessed directory for Strelka. And what Stroka has done is it's run Yara against this, and it's determined that this file is bad, right? So, and when I say bad, what happens is we have an event in here. If I exclude the OSEC events, we'll see this event or this alert right here, this mal command script obfuscated bat. And if we drill down into that, All right, we can see that this is just an alert generated from Strelka and the severity and whatnot, and then we can see that it's a batch file, right? We can see the various scanners that Strelka's used to try to identify this file. We can see some other characteristics, and if we scroll down, we can see some keywords that it's determined that it's pulled out of the batch file. We also see some text and, and some other good stuff there. But the main thing here is that, you know, we've kind of taken this stream from the network, network data, Right, we've taken it to the file level. We've now detected this file that we think is bad or could be bad. And then we wanna go off and do something further with that. And how do we do that? Well, so what we can do is, you know, I mentioned earlier, we can have a workflow to search across our enterprise for something like a hash or a file name. So that's exactly what we have set up here. In NADN, we have this workflow and it's waiting right here, this webhook is, let's see if I can move it over to the side of the screen. This webhook is waiting for us to act on it, and I'll show you how we're gonna act on it in just a minute. But it's going to receive this in here at the webhook, and it's going to route by observable type. So if it's a hash, it's gonna go to that zeroth endpoint, and if it's a file name, it's going to go to the number one endpoint right there. And then we're gonna perform that hash hunt or the file name hunt in Velociraptor. So we're gonna take any host that we have configured as a client to Velociraptor, and then we're gonna search and see if that file exists on there. And then, let's see, you actually can't see it here, but I'll show you in just a minute. But uh, this workflow here just calls the pi Velociraptor uh, executable, right, or the binary, and this is going to create a hunt and search for that hash. And the way that we're gonna act on that, we're gonna execute this test workflow uh, because we're not necessarily running it in production. We wanna test it out and see how it works. And, you know, I'm looking at this event and, you know, I'm trying to think of, you know, what's a great way to do that, right? We mentioned hash. So, you know, I know MD5 is not the greatest, but for the sake of demonstration, I'll just choose MD5. And I'll choose actions. And, what we can see here is that I've actually added an additional action for Velociraptor and for the workflow um, to where we can find this, right? We can search for this hash, and then if we find the hash, 
Maybe we contain the endpoint. Maybe we try to quarantine it, right? And then do some further investigation. Obviously, you'd want to use this judiciously. There are some cases where you wouldn't want to do this. You can obviously label certain clients or certain servers to not do this type of thing. But we'll continue on with the demo. Um, so I'm just going to click Find and Contain. And let's go back over here and just note that our web, we're still waiting for the webhook call here. And we're just going to click Find and Contain. All right, you can see that the status changed over here. All right, and we can see that the webhook is fired. The route has fired, and the hash hunt has fired. All right, and now, if we look over here, we'll just go over here to the hunt. And it might have been, uh-oh, I think my other VM might have, yep. Okay, let me start it back up real quick. My bad, demo fail number one. All right, we'll get to it. Don't you worry. Don't you worry, oh, look at that beautiful resolution. All right, so now I'm just, I pop this thing back up. It has a tendency to go and sleep on me sometimes, so. All right, so what we're gonna do here, I'm just gonna jog the service real quick. Just because, um, well actually it should pick up here in a minute. I'll just do this. And so what'll happen is clients will check in now let me go ahead and just refresh this. And I think it's because it slept on me. Let me just go and jog it real quick. Do this, D to D, just for demo purposes because sometimes it'll back off and then it'll try to hit the server again so it might take a second. But we'll do this, all right. And then let's go and see. In the hunt, we're just waiting on the schedule. We'll just click kick off another one for fun just to do this, just because it was sleeping when I was doing that. All right, and we'll just go find and contain. Let that workflow run. And now we see that one was scheduled, right? We see a client was scheduled for this hunt. And we see one row was returned. And what that means is that it found a result Right, so it actually found something on the endpoint. Okay, so if we go over to the client itself and look at the collected data, we can actually see here that that file, that poker.bat file that we were looking for was actually returned. We noticed that it, it was on this host and we can actually keep a rolling database. Uh, this is a little specific to Velociraptor, but we can keep a rolling database of those hashes so that those files do roll off. We can identify if they were there at some point. But we also see that, you know, we got that hit. We saw that there was a match there. We also see that the host was quarantined. So now what happens is that only Velociraptor can communicate with this host. So we can perform additional remote forensics if we need to. We can drill down even more, right? And then if we wanted, you know, either even further confirmation um, in the action, we could pivot to another window. We could open another tab to this screen, or we can also have an additional alert populated for the Windows remediation quarantine inside of Security Onion, letting us know that this host was quarantined. Now we need to go check it out, right? So it's pretty cool to be able to go from something like Actions or maybe in somewhat of a more automated fashion once you've matured a bit, and take this data, act on these events and the data from these events, and go perform these types of operations and, and kind of speed up, uh, you know, I mean, you're searching across, you know, you could be thousands of hosts, right? Um, speed up that analysis and speed up that response phase and that investigation, and uh, yeah, just gain more efficiency. All right, so that's all for the demo. Thank you. All right, any questions, any snide remarks, anything?
All right. Well, I appreciate you guys taking the time to come down. And uh, once again, it was great presenting. And y'all have a great rest of the day checking out all these other awesome speakers. Thank you.